we're going to say fuck on television, we're going to look completely and utterly different to anybody else that's around, and that includes hippies. When the Sex Pistols came along, I thought, you know, it's just um, the Rolling Stones with a Cockney accent. But each time a collaborator is exposed, a hundred punks spring up to take his place, adamant in their belief that musicians are no different and no more talented than their audience. To me, it felt as though I put my finger in an electric socket and, you know, I just go, yeah. It wasn't a fly-by-night thing, and it wasn't to do with safety pins or anything else. It went far deeper than that. I didn't know there was a punk movement. I mean, um, I don't know what it is. I don't, I've never known, actually, what the punk movement is or the establishing, establishing of it. Within months, penguins were pogoing and hippies had cut their hair as the enemies strove to implant an identity crisis. I think Malcolm's contribution was massive in that he packaged the whole cultural event. Fashion mongers were encouraged to copy, dilute and sell the utility uniforms of punk. I mean, these days you can walk down the street and you've got fuck, shit, whatever all over your seizure. Back in those days, if you did that, it was like... Asking me, is punk going to come back? It's never gone away. Might have slept for a while. What are you coming for? A bit of a stir? No, buy some clothes. The 1970s was a strange decade because it came after the joint revolutions of the Beatles, the Stones. Groups of youngsters like these have teamed together with one ambition, to top the hit parade. And the counterculture that came about as a result of a massive change in society politically and that the working classes were beginning to get empowered culturally financially. There are problems, you know, which have been pushed underground for too long, which are today, you know, they have to be brought People up People haven't got life. time to think about the cosmos and the universe, you know, yeah. and they ain't got any money to live on. Well, I mean, if there was jobs, then they wouldn't be on adult. And maybe we'd be singing about love and kissing or something. What sets us apart from the other generations before us of working class people is we had absolutely no illusions. We knew it was a rigged game. You start off in school and they take your soul away. They take your brains away. You're not allowed to have an opinion that differs from theirs. We had fuck all and suddenly everybody was making this fuss about us having nothing. What I remember about London at that period was that large parts of it were derelict. There were big areas where there was just corrugated iron and emptiness. I think out of the dustbins on the streets of England, we have this incredible exportable commodity, which is this fabulous group of kids and maybe even their redundant fathers bowling out onto the streets to create this wonderful, raucous energy. Everyone's complaining about these mountains of garbage and rats and everything, you know, and. Um, then some people are burning it down. All the kids are supposed to sort of like be factory prodder, you know, that sort of stuff. My dad made me an ultimatum, you either bring £20 a week, you know, you sling your hook. So I slung my hook. We were living, already starting to live around squats. And then you had the riot. I just remember those years as being incredibly violent. It's violent in a way in which it isn't now. And you had that sense of the streets not being safe. You had to put up with everything being stopped and searched, being beaten up, being punched in the face by the police. So we're right in the, uh, you know, knives when we were living like that. 
Did you? Did you have any knives? No, well I'd nip me, wouldn't I? I'd like me, right. You had to put up with everything and you couldn't do nothing about it. There was a massive disillusionment amongst those that thought things were going to change. They weren't changing. People are sick and fed up of this country, telling them what to do. It was a pretty grim time, plus a sense of disappointment that the 60s were over, that we hadn't been able to get to the party. And we wanted a party of our own. We wanted a riot of our own. Politicians have created an incredible language of deceit. And that language we're about to dent the armor of. One huge movement thought, to hell with that, we are going to say something very different, something radical. gone around and bought old clothes and set up a shop called Let It Rock in 1971, I decided I wanted to, to concoct some things myself, either recut things or rework things or slam a slogan on something or customise stuff. I became and, a customer um, of the sex shop, or Too Fast To Live, Too Young To Done, as it was then. I basically just wanted a pair of brothel creepers, so I had to... Uh, Walk the whole, you know, I walked the whole length of the King's Road, uh, going, well, you know, where the fuck is it? We used to go in there and, like, it's the only place you could get brothel creepers, you know, in, in probably in London then. We loved mixing it all up. If you could afford a draped jacket, which Malcolm sold as well, you'd grab one of them. Malcolm had been to several art colleges and was looking for something to earn money. Vivian being totally craft and me being very art formed a kind of an alliance in which she did all the bloody work and I did all the folder rolls and ideas and all the, all the stuff that lazy buggers like people like me do. <laughs> It was in World's End, you know, down the end of the King's Road. It looked odd, I think, for the time. It was a very uh, different looking shop. You literally walked through this glass door with this sort of huge metal grating on the front into what was like this open space with just one rail going down the middle and all the clothes were on that and then they were all sort of round the corner. We really didn't do anything, to be honest with you. We just sat around posing. I mean, that's what it was all about. Everyone would come in. We were like mannequins to show off the clothes. I mean, I was a fan of Vivian's clothes long before I actually got involved in the whole music side of it. And I'd go in and wear everything. And that's why she asked me to sort of go and work there. I ended up working at McLaren's shop just because it, A, I needed a job. B, it, it was kind of this weird place. I kind of felt affinity to it because you walked in there and it was like your grand's living room. It was like real 50s kind of thing. But there was all these oddball characters coming in and it was my exit from the straight world. What's this thing you've got against the sippies? They're complacent. In the great rock and roll swindle, one of my favourite lines is Malcolm McLaren saying, never trust a hippie. And I kind of know exactly what he meant by that because the hippie culture was a very, very peculiar mixture of phony philosophies and, and ridiculous new age ideas about religion and science.
the hippie generation had failed. There was beginning to be a kind of a backlash about social permissive um, ideals that peace and love generation psychedelia had offered to society. What do you think about bands like the Stones? I don't. <laughs> I don't even consider them a band, they're more like a business. When they had the Stones and the Who and they came along, and they thought they were great because they destroyed everything that went before them. But now they can't take it because we're destroying everything that's gone before us. I think the music scene was pretty awful. I mean, I really can't remember too much at all happening before sort of punk came, you know, came onto the scene. What about bands like Rod Stewart? What about him? Mums and dads, yeah. He's all round, isn't he? All round entertainment. He's an old We had, you know, Rod Stewart, probably during, like, you know, his worst stage, prancing around, going, don't you think I'm sexy? Rod Stewart gets up there and starts, like, going on with his string orchestra, you know what I mean? It's not what you feel like. So you've got to have some music what you feel like. Otherwise you go balmy, don't you? I mean, the only other person I can remember sort of coming out of that period was Leo Sayer. And to put Leo Sayre as a highlight is, says something about <laughs> the other highlights. There weren't many. There weren't many at all. It was the end of glam rock, really. Um, David Bowie and Roxy Music were doing different things. Um, it was no longer glam rock, which was great, great fun. I, I adored glam rock, but it was over. Glam rock kind of died anyway. I mean, we didn't mind that. That was fun. This progressive rock stuff, Rick Wakeman, you know, you have to come from the Royal Art College of Music to be in a band. I mean, get out of here, do you know what I mean? It's hardly, you know, and a lot of these progressive rock bands, you know, were like that, and it was like, boring. The whole virtuosic kind of white rock thing was just completely dead in the water, as far as I was concerned. I don't think prog rock was so important in the sense of rage that punk rock expressed. I think the sense of rage was actually at the hideousness of mainstream pop music. You were just attacking Top of the Pops and the sort of bands that are on there. What, do you think they're relevant to the kids 16, 17? Of course they're not. Relevant to their mums and dads, but that's about all. If you look at the Top of the Pops from 1976. And, uh, we've got a couple of requests to read out, and I think I'm going to enjoy this more than anybody, because a young lady has written a request right across her front. <laughs> it's just fucking dreadful. It's middle-aged, 30-something, middle seen middle middle-aged then, patronising DJs in polyester, leering at young girls. Can you please play a request for, I hope my wife isn't watching, for Jan and Alec, Jim and Les, John and Paula, and everybody from Bristol, is that right? Coventry. Oh, Coventry, sorry, I thought it must be Bristol, pardon? You couldn't fit them in, I'm not surprised you've got enough there, haven't you? <laughs> Terrible novelty records about CB radio, combine harvesters. Oh, are, oh, are, after three. One, two, three. Not the mere mention of that title enough to give you the heebie-jeebies. Anyone that was any Thing decent, Bowie or any of those bands had all gone to America. If there was nothing happening, we thought we'd do it ourselves, basically. And that's what it is, pure boredom, like, you know, we'll do a band which someone can come and see. It felt as though things were going to speed up. A very important part of this was Dr Feelgood, who I saw several times that year, and they were terrific and they were very tough and aggressive and speedy and it seemed as though something was going to happen. Big game changer was when the New York Dolls came out in I suppose 72, 73. Suddenly here was something that seemed glamorous and sexy and that attracted girls and was stonesy rock and roll 
but had a sort of an edginess as well. I was always into the, the American scene, like Iggy Pop, you know, even Lou Reed, um, the underground, um, Hollywood Brats, New York Dolls. And I see pinheads with Cadillacs. Iggy Pop was completely crucial to the punk movement musically. His lyrics, his attitude to drugs, the way he used guitars and his voice, fantastically important to Malcolm. To find out more about those groups, you had to go and get magazines like Rock Scene, which was an American monthly magazine. And to get that, you'd have to go to Camden Market, a shop called Compendium Books, which was the only magazine shop in London that imported those American rock scene magazines. The other big game changer, I have to say, is the Ramones. Well, that first Ramones album, which now sounds quite tame, sped the whole of rock music up. All the bands literally tripled speed overnight, and suddenly punk rock was associated with that rama lama lama, you know, super speed stuff. It changed everything. And you know the fact that there were no drum rolls, that it was just and it was just really simple three chords. When I started writing and was dreaming, I had to start somewhere. And the natural place was in number 430 Kings Road, and the natural place was with Malcolm McLaren, because he put the Sex Pistols together. <music> McLaren and Westwood have gone through Teddy Boys, Edwardians, Rockers, uh, Zoot Suits, Fetish Wear, um, and they're starting to make their own designs by 75. Just dressing exactly you know, how you want to look and finding clothes that are original, not like wearing everything that everyone else wears. The first punks I ever saw um, were to me like a living collage of 40s and 50s and 60s clothes. That's what I loved about it. That had the first impact in 76. They looked fabulous. Malcolm and I had researched street fashion to such an extent that we actually invented one of our own. We'd been so interested in cults that we invented a cult of our own and that was punk rock. And no one saw that until the Sex Pistols. The scene was so tiny at that time and that uh, I'd started to run adverts in Melody Maker. I'd met Mick Jones. We got in incredibly well because we were both reading Diary of a Rock and Roll Star by Ian Hunter. There just has to be new groups and then that's what you got. At that time Mick had moved to Archway and I still lived at home in Twickenham and it was the entire length of the 27 bus route and it used to take two hours 40 minutes from Twickenham to Archway Station. So we could sort of sit there on the Thursday to answer the phone. We did get a, a letter from a bloke called Morrissey who lived in Manchester to us in 1975, 76, living in Manchester might as well have been living on Mars. We went to see, I think it was Death School at the Nashville. That night, uh, a little guy came up and was standing next to us, and he had the same t shirt on, you know, and in that sort of stroppy teenager way. We went, Oi, mate, can't you? go and stand over there. And he went, look, you cunts, I designed this fucking T-shirt. Who, who the fuck are you? You know, and we said, well, we've got this group. It's going to be called the London SS. And he went, well, that's interesting. My mate's got a group called the Sex Pistols. You were looking and hoping to see the most dreadful and, and, and wonderful um, energy that could be best described as 
you know, your first fuck. Fashion of punk was carried on the back of one band, and that was the Sex Pistols. It's not about the music, it's not about even what they're saying. The whole attitude, the whole vibe was, was something just squashes and flattens everything that's gone before. Pistols started to play, people started to see them, and that, and, you know, and then other bands started to, you know, kind of sp sprang off that. The likes of Led Zeppelin, Queen and the Pink Floyd need to be chucked in the classical music section. Those and bands like them are composers, musicians and artists. They've got to make way for real people, and the Sex Pistols are the first of them. So London SS played, rehearsed, never did a gig, never really found a singer. On the recordings it's mixed singing. The recording was made in front of Malcolm and Bernie. But we didn't really have our own songs, a couple of early Clash ones maybe. Um, I was in a band myself and um, one of my guitarists, Martin Stone, was in a London SS, a famous early prototype of punk. And he kept coming back to me and saying, all the guys talk about is clothes how tight their trousers are and stuff like this. I said, well, you must be in your element. He said, yeah, but let's get, let's get some music too, you know. If it's going to be something that changes culturally the music scene, it has to be about great tunes, but it has to be about lyrically. It has to be about a movement. It has to be about a cultural shift. <laughs> Bernie would keep coming in and his mantra was, you don't know what you're about. Your group's got nothing to say. And we go, well, but what do you mean? It was like a riddle. And he goes, I can't tell you the answer because if I tell you the answer, you won't be for real. So I can only pose the questions. So I think, you know, London SS initially was Bernie's way and the Pistols were Malcolm's version. Mick and I drifted our separate ways. Mick went off with Bernie. Well, and then he met me, yeah. and then he uh, met me, and then we met him, right? Got that? That's how we met. It was coincidence. And then we all met him together. Bernie always felt I was much too middle class to be uh, the real deal, and uh, can see why he might think that. I did really love The Clash. The uh, Clash were a big influence in the subs. It's just so they hate hippies, everything they stand for, and the hippies, what, what went wrong with music. I suppose it ain't their fault. They had too much dope. Yeah, lying on the floor and looking at the ceiling. But it's another generation to yours. Yeah, one that went wrong. They become the lads kind of punk group. And we live in a pop culture where, you know, the lads rule. You went to see a lot of these bands. I mean, even the, the clash in the beginning. Usually the sets were quite short. And you couldn't, you couldn't really tell what they were singing about. I mean, a lot of them hadn't had records out, so you weren't, you weren't uh, aware of the records, so you didn't know the songs that much. What did you think of the, uh, of the They were great. They were great. If I could only make out the words, they'd be greater. Is she really going out with him? Me and Brian James were working together and we decided we were going to be, the, be a group. We were looking for a singer. It wasn't really about anything other than the way they looked. At the Pistols gig we decided that we just, you know, what we were doing was just looking at the crowd. And, and Sid walked in looking absolutely fucking fantastic with his spiky black hair and this, I think he had this like lame drape jacket on. And just being this sort of gangly, horrible, creature that absolutely star written all over him, you know. I went up and had a word with him and we asked him to come down to, if he'd like to try out singing for us. Oh, he didn't turn up. And the same night Dave Vaynan had walked in. And I'd already met Dave through Malcolm. So we did this audition. I think it was a, 
it was a gay vicar that ran this place and they got the, the room for free sort of thing. I don't know how. So I came down early, nobody ever showed. And it turned out that, uh, you know, there was no one else there. I did the thing, they liked me anyway. We, we got on really well and the rest is history, as they say. I was in the band for all this time. this gathering of kids who were recognizing what was on stage and, with, and were wearing that same kind of look, throwing out what their failed um, older brothers and sisters had been doing in the hippie era. That's sort of one of the current problems at the moment is identity. You know, people to identify with something, everybody's looking desperately to try and identify with one thing instead of themselves. At that time, oh, the crop thing's coming back, but the, but the twist on it was you had it dyed, and you could have it blue. It was like, oh, okay, right, you know. So you dye, yeah, and that was an adventure, dyeing your hair shocking white or jet black. Remember, at this time, we're still trying to look like Johnny Thunders. The concept of cutting your hair was totally alien. We just spent six years at school having to stand outside in maths lessons for having long hair. You know, so it was a real major hassle to have long hair in those days. As interesting as what was up on stage was what these young people in the audience who were are not booing, who are absolutely obviously being seen to be lapping it up and laughing with the attitude of um, the youths on stage. And the fact that the women were looking as tough as the boys was to me another step change in, um, in the equality of the sexes. Here were these youths wearing very tough clothes. So it was, you know, get away from all this peace and love hippie stuff. And so there were no jeans, sharp trousers, an altogether tougher look. Being commercial, I like to be like everybody else, I suppose I'm an extrovert. I like to walk down the road and everybody look at me and things like that. We used to go to, say, um, second hand shops to just grab clothes and uh, as long as they didn't smell and they looked all right, you just bunged them on for a quid or 50p or whatever and uh, you looked great every, every day, so you mixed up clothes, basically. It was very interesting to see in the early days this kind of very put together, homemade punk image with second-hand suits and real second-hand ripped jumpers. I had my mother and my grandmother with those big knitting needles knitting those, you know, those big holy punk rock sweaters that I'm wearing in all the photos knitted by my grandmother. <laughs> but what's really important is that in that shop, he still had old stock. He had brothel creepers from the Let It Rock days. He had studied T-shirts with Venus written on and motorcycle patches on and bike tires on the, across the shoulders. So you could find all these things mixed up in one shop. And the young customers possibly just thought, well, this is, this is the look, not knowing that something might have been four or five years old. Suddenly you've got guys walking around in new bondage trousers with a pair of brothel creepers from the, from the Let It Rock shop, and maybe a studded T-shirt from Too Fast To Live, Too Young To Die. Fashion mongers were encouraged to copy, dilute, and sell the utility uniforms of punk. But then when it so obviously worked, and it was so, it, there was obviously a whole generation of people empathizing with that look, um, then it became much more polished. And then of course, um, Malcolm and Vivian were kind of commercializing that look. What had been a weapon, they tried to make a toy. Well, really, I don't think, um... This shop isn't really punk, as far as I can see it. It's just a shop which sells sort of very well-made, well-thought-out clothes, and I think um, 
doesn't fall into any particular category. There are a lot of references on the McLaren and Westwood clothes. I mean, it was literally on the body. There was something, maybe a T-shirt, say, had maybe something from a Alex Trochey porn novel or a gay porn photo book by John Barrington. I sell more T-shirts than anything else in the shop, particularly this one. This has been my best-selling T-shirt this year. Thank goodness for, for a bit of sanity somewhere. We bought a T-shirt from Malcolm shop, one of those t-shirts that say, one of these days you'll know which side of the bed you've been lying on. Some of the shirts had swastikas and some of them had pictures of Karl Marx, so there was a lot of this extremist outre imagery. All those things were obviously anti the high street, anti even the King's Road. They had never been seen before. The shop had this extremist gay imagery, the cowboy t-shirt, two cocks hanging down, S&M imagery. The Cambridge rapist, who was, um, you know, a very notorious serial rapist in, in Britain in, I think it was 1974. Anything that would cause, a, anything that would upset somebody. I did look good, I have to say. I was one of the very first people to wear the tie T-shirt, the, uh, you know, the, well, they're quite contentious now, but, the, you know, the porno T-shirt, you know, the Cambridge rapist T-shirt. Of course, I was arrested for the cowboy T-shirt, which became a very famous sort of like cause celeb in all the newspapers. <laughs> We were looking for motives of rebellion. Malcolm got onto the idea of sex, sexual confrontation. And so the obvious thing was leather, bondage gear. What sort of people come in here? They're sort of people about my age, really. We either had real fashionable, like, uh, young kids, or older men who thought all the bondage and all the leather and all the rubber stuff was like a fetish thing. There were so many times that they'd actually try and get us to put on all these rubber clothes and go and have a quick wank in the dressing rooms. That happened time and time again. I said to Jordan, I thought we ought to be able to charge for this. But it was par for the course in those days. We just took it as it came. Little girls should be seen and not heard. Oh, I made the bondage trousers and then he absolutely brilliantly put the strap round the leg. I came up with the idea, well, you know, you've got to tie the legs together, so we've got to form a strap around the kneecaps. We should have a zip that wouldn't ordinarily end at your balls, but would go right up your bum. You, you could immediately <laughs> undo the zip and the whole goddamn lot would just fall out. Although Malcolm and Vivian call their shop sex, uh, that was provocative and a good marketing tool. In fact, when you went and bought things there, they weren't necessarily only to do with sex. They were to do with something that might be a statement about yourself. Nothing like it had been seen before, especially when you try and bombard the public with Nazi swastikas and and rubber wear and masks that zip up and whatever in the light of things like the Cambridge rapist who was known to walk around in these masks I mean it was very provocative indeed and that really set the scene for for the music to lay nice and sweetly on top of it <laughs> Pistols in Denmark Street, there's Malcolm's shop at the World's End, Let It Rock, which is now sex. And then in the middle of the King's Road, Bernie had a shop. But there's also a shop run by John Cravine called Acme Attractions. He'd thought, well, we've got a shop, we should have a group. So he was forming a group around Gene October called Chelsea. I thought you had to be rich to get a band together. Well, you didn't really. You just bumped into people like you, you liked and said, oh, do you play anything? Or do you play bass? A lot of people lied. I'd answered an ad for wanting musicians for this group called Chelsea, which Billy had applied to as well. 
and Billy and I became Gene's backing group. You know, I played bass and Billy played guitar. And so our next part of my journey was being in Chelsea, of hanging out in Acme Attractions, of going to John Cravine's workshops. Chelsea was like um, originate one of the first bands ever to play yeah. the Roxy, you know, with with other bands, you know, right? Um, he's very, very, very important to the music that's going down now. It's very hardcore, very political. We did our first gig at the ICA on the Mall, supporting a show with a guy called Genesis Peorage from Frobbing Gristle, and he called the show music from the Death Factory. Really, all he did was did pictures of Auschwitz, James Hanratty hanging, all, all these various pictures of death scenes and whatever. But he wanted a band to sort of play in the other hall. And he said, would we do it? And he said, yeah. But we won't call ourselves Chelsea, we'll call ourselves LSD. Because we, we didn't want the Pistols to come and see us or any of those other bands to see what we were up to. No, because the bands were already pretty insular. You know, because a lot of it was about having a base, you know, and the Pistols had Denmark Street and the Clash had their place over in Camden, you know. And so there was all, always a kind of slight sense of secrecy about what was going on with the band anyway and who was in it. There's Billy and I in a group with Gene October and Billy and I are thinking, well, you know, I don't know, Gene's not really singing about the stuff that we're particularly interested in. I'd started to write a bunch of lyrics and Billy went, well, I could write a tune for that. The accountant at the time of the, uh, uh, who worked for John Cravine, talked these boys into saying, look, get rid of Gene, Billy should front the band. And so we just, cruelly at one gig at the Nashville, when we'd finished a Chelsea set, Billy and I said, uh, oh, we've written this new song, let's go on and do it in the encore. And Gene went, how does it go? We went, oh, don't worry about it, you just stand at the back. So they started a new band called Generation X. I was not ousted, but, you know, they didn't want to carry on doing Chelsea. Which is incredibly cruel when I look back at it, but it's sort of just what you didn't think about that stuff. I was, like, kind of gutted at the time, but I thought, let's get on with it. That night, before I went to sleep, I wrote the ride to her. Punk rock became associated with Dole Q rock, the idea that all the groups were on the dole. But in fact, you know, when I was at school wanting to be in a group, the clear path was you either went to university or art school, because in those days, the government gave you money. Second term at college, bought a Rickenbacker bass. The musical climate at the time was that you had to be a very competent musician to be able to go on a stage and play in front of an audience. And suddenly that it was kind of like somebody turned the light on and said, you know what, you've done. Punk rock was more to do with people just not knowing how to play college of music stuff, you know, chords or whatever, just being somebody, they found a, a busker somewhere and go, show me two chords or, and that was it, you wrote a song around that. I mean, like, all's music is really is just uh, a collection of noises, and if you can remember how to make the same noise twice, that's music. If it woke you up, the noise that you were making, I mean, turn the amp up and put a fuzz on it, that's a great sound. And there are all these stories of so many people in groups laying down their previous lives and taking up the banners and taking up the standard and becoming punk rock. You know, Buzzcocks, Clash, X-Ray Specs, Polystyrene. favourite clubs was a club called Chagaramas, which was a lesbian club, <laughs> but if you look weird enough they let you in. A month later we went back, back to this club and um, it became the Roxy. 
all the kids down there were much, much younger and eventually I said to my band, you know, you've got to come down, this is the future of rock and roll. So um, they went down there and it was on a damn night and um, they were just blown away and said, oh, we want to be a punk rock band. Yeah, well, punk was just starting to, to move along a bit. There were some, I mean, the Pistols had a residency at the 100 Club for some time, and that was starting to build, you know, and, and attract different people. Uh, the Clash came in a few times. The Damned had emerged. So I decided it was time for a, to go over ground and do a big festival. I knew it was going to be a success because the queue went right around the block. Um, I was part of, um, in the first 100 Club Punk Rock Festival, I kind of was, it, it was part of the planning because I put myself online to say that this is going to be a movement, a punk rock movement. Yeah, I did a, the 100 Club the Punk Festival. Susie and the Banshee. It was me, Billy, Billy Idol and Susie and we were talking to Malcolm. He was moaning because he's got the, he had this two days of gigs at uh, the 100 Club that he was going to call this a punk festival, but he didn't have enough bands for it. So Billy immediately said, oh, we'll do it, because the three of us had sort of, you know, talked a little bit about having a band. Billy was the only one who could play anything. Susie wanted to sing, and she'd done a few auditions for people and stuff, but nothing that she, she liked. So Billy just blurted this out, that we had a band. Of course, we didn't have a band. It was about two weeks away from the actual gig, so we had to try and figure out how we were going to do this. I'd gone to see Queen in Hyde Park doing a free concert, believe it or not, and uh, I met Sue and Steve and a bunch of other, other people there. And we left. Before Queen came on, we actually stayed to watch at Kiki D. And then we ended up at Billy Idol's house in Bromley. Got to sort of talking, and they, I just said, no, I play guitar. And they sort of said, oh, do you want to go do a gig on Tuesday? And I said, all right. Sid Vicious on drums, Steve Spunker on bass, Marco on guitar, and me just doing the vocals. Sid suggested that we attempted to destroy as many songs as possible in the space of 20 minutes. So we all came up with ideas of what were the worst songs we could possibly destroy. The Lord's Prayer via Twist and Shout, Knocking on Heaven's Door, and a bit of Deutschland, Deutschland, Uber Alley. Oh, 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 oh. Then we had a rehearsal at the Clash's Rehearsals, Rehearsals, is now known. The first thing you see when you walk into Camden Market, um, we had a rehearsal there, 20 minutes, went to the pub, and then we did the gig. Had you sung before? Not on stage, no. Did you think that was important? Um, no. We didn't know what we were doing. We just went up there and uh, I think just 20 minutes of, of blind fear, really. They got on the, uh, they got on the stage and basically none of them could play or do anything. It just performance art. Sid was just about tapping the drums as lightly as he could. He seemed frightened of them. He never tried to get around the kit or anything, just lightly tapping it, you know, like at a tea party with old ladies and things. You know. and that was about it for them. It got boring in some parts, but it picked up. British punk I saw as being very cartoony, a bit of horror movie and a lot of science fiction which people tend to forget because people tend to think of punk as being kind of social realism but it wasn't at the end of the day. Even The Clash who everybody thinks is a very socially conscious band had a lot of J.G. Ballard in them. What I liked about the sexual politics of the time was hopeless boys like Subway Sect, a bit clueless, a bit kind of mm, not, I don't really think they're like 
most songs. They're sort of the words that are used in them aren't the sort of words that you usually get in rock records. This song, this is for you jerk offs in the audience. Punk was all about the weirdos, you know, I was a weirdo, I was an outcast, I felt an outcast at the time um, because I was gay and it wasn't such a great thing at that time of, um, in Britain uh, and I felt like shit and suddenly you have this movement where there's a whole bunch of other people who felt like shit and suddenly you're in a room together and you feel great. That weirdo aspect of punk, that gender aspect of punk, um, is fantastically important, and it's one of the reasons that punk is still not heard so much, why people um, don't understand it. It was an integral part of it. It was for the outsider, it was for the weirdos, for the freaks. And to me, I will always think that that's what pop culture should be about. Within two weeks after seeing the Sex Pistols, I'd written and pasted up the graphics for and printed on a Xerox machine. 15, 16 page fanzine called London That Outrage. I just did it, it was totally instinctive. And that's very, very exciting. NME were, were ignoring nascent punk rock at that time. You know, I think there was that famous piece in NME where they said it's never going to happen and if this is the future of rock and roll, we're giving up or something. I went to Melody Maker and said, look, I think this is really important. You know, can you commission me to write about this? Melody Maker said no. And so because I realised its importance, I decided just as a journalist and as a social investigator, I would uh, write about it. And so I began turning up at the band. I bought myself a camera, started taking photographs because I, you know, I had confidence in my intellect and that, the, that there was something really important happening here. The music papers, along with everybody else, was tired of the, the old game, the old music business game, and in consequence, got very involved and very interested in punk rock. And Sounds was one of the first to really uh, pick up on it and to, to explore it. Punk as a word obviously has got long antecedents in prison slang. In prison slang it's the guy who takes the wang up the bung. We never actually liked the word punk by the way, you know, it was some weird American stupid word. In the mid 70s it was revived obviously in Happy Days. Well that magazine came out in America, Punk, which sort of defined the term. But the popular cartoon image of punk I believe was nothing to do with us, was nothing to do with the Clash, and really nothing to do with the Pistols. It's kind of got that sense of, um, you know, we're the lowest of the low, you know, you're a dirty punk. Um, it's very much somebody who's on the bottom of the pile. There were lots of arguments about what should, it should be called in 1976, should it be called street rock or should it be called new wave. Eventually everybody settled on punk, certainly by the time the tabloids got hold of it in September, October 76, it, it had become punk. Punk rock mutated into this cartoon image of those spiky head, doll cube, boredom, safety pinned people. We were never anything to do with that. In terms of clothes, you had to make a pilgrimage to Lewis Leathers, which was the only motorbike shop in London where you could actually walk in and buy a leather jacket. We didn't know any Hells Angels at that time, so we didn't have any access to the world of leather jackets. Well, the motorcycle jacket, is, up until that point, had always been seen as a rebellious item of clothing, hence the, the rockers in the 60s, the Tunnock Boys in the 50s. Um, it was the mark of the outsider, it was perceived to be the mark of the outsider due to the way the press reacted to it. And a, a lot of that also because of the people that wore it. Marlon Brando was the first person to really make the big statement 
of wearing the, the motorcycle leather jacket. Black leather obviously was such an important part of it. And I think it goes back to the wild one and even, you know, reflected through Happy Days performance. The other big influence was the Ramones. The Ramones first album came out in the summer of 76 and on the cover the whole band were wearing American motorcycle jackets. This was quite an inspirational thing to see if you were you know, a young British teenager. Everybody knows that in the mid-70s if you wanted a leather jacket you'd go to Lewis Leathers. But in terms of something else that was kind of shocking and, and street level. Certainly Malcolm and Vivian's shop was the, uh, the center, central place to visit. Apparently the story is that a young guy walked into the shop with what Malcolm calls a, a pigeon st studded onto the back of his jacket and he really took to the whole decorated jacket look studs, badges and patches. Hello there. This afternoon I'm going to show you how to destroy your school uniform and turn it into the very latest punk outfit. Now just look at this. Here in the top pocket, I've put a thumb with a razor blade going through it. And we come round to the back of the garment, and here we have some pictures. Now, four of these I bought in the Soho area of London. This is the patch which uh, Malcolm would have originally referred to as the, the pigeon studded onto a rocker's jacket. The image is of a, a sort of a German eagle, which was kind of a very, very strong image to, to wear back then, especially on your back, you know, it's really worn to upset your, your mums and dads who'd obviously been through the war and it caused a bit of a stir on the street. And this is again was one of the reasons why people tended to avoid people wearing leather jackets. So there we are, good luck and enjoy yourselves. People didn't wear black leather bikers jackets, that was very dangerous. You know, that was back into being a hell's angel if you did that. <laughs> December of 76, uh, members of the Clash were spotted wearing Lewis Leather's jackets and this was really something that got picked up on by a lot of the fans at the time. I saw the Pistols very early on at Chelsea Art School and I remember I was wearing a brown leather jacket thinking, oh God, I shouldn't be wearing brown. I remember the first time I was really wearing my leather jacket and a gang of men walked up to me to challenge my position on the pavement to make sexist remarks and I just was able to strike out and defend myself. And so that idea of like the leather encasement of individuals, which gives them a kind of on-street strength, was, was really definitive of what punk youth was trying to do with this change of clothes. If you want a personal touch, I can't be fucking bothered. Come on, what? Sid Vicious, he had a lot of attitude, which he carried very well. You know, not, not everybody can wear, this, wear a leather jacket and a T-shirt and look great. But Sid certainly did it, and he, he was really the iconic uh, punk rocker of those early times. Sid was at the vanguard of dumbing it down, adopting kitsch. This is actually leather jackets, big spiky hair, padlocks. It's actually kitsch, it's not even punk anymore. Saturday, you know, the Ted's come down here and the punk's come down here. You know, they sort of group together and, you know, there's clashes and things like that. We're Teddy Boys, we like rock and roll because we think there's never been a better music and we like our style of dress because we think it's the best. It's a sacrilege. Punks wearing uh, drapes and uh, sort of like brothel creepers. Earrings, short hair, it all stems from a bit of skin, a bit of Ted, and they take the piss all the time. So everyone I see, bus along the road, in the swimming bars, I'll give them a good eye. You're looking at 40, 50 year old Ted's, big building working guys, you know, who used to just go for it on kids. Some punks used to go sod it and have, have it back. You don't come here to stir anything up? Huh? No, just the Teddy boys always start on me and I steam to see it, steam into them. What, what, what's the cause of the fight? Why? Because I don't like them. You just don't like them? <laughs> but you're both English? <laughs> yeah. It's a bit stupid, isn't it? Never mind the bank holidays in Brighton or so. I mean, between the mods and rockers, it was like a big thing on the King's Road with the Teds and the punks. It was funny, actually, sometimes, you know. As Teddy boys, you know, used to sort of, used to try and beat up the King's Road, like, we're Teds for life. And when everybody else sort of moves on, you know. And he had a dog collar on with a dog's chain round his neck and a little bit of leather where you hold on to the dog light at the end. And he had tickets all stuck over him with safety pins. And he just had all his shirts ripped, everything. And yet there's nothing good about that, is there?
Vivian Westwood was punk and is punk. I thought she was an amazingly attractive person to be with because she was so quiet and creative. It was original, it was unique, and it came from her, it didn't come from Malcolm. Malcolm knew how to use it. He was an impresario, but Vivian was the designer. I expect the main heading you could really give them now is distinct from the sex thing. I think you'd have to call them urban gorilla. I think that's yeah, the, yeah. The, the main kind of theme that would make people understand them. Um, mm -hmm. They've got yeah. touches of primitive yeah. things. Um, people who come in my shop notice Jordan wear sort of rather tribal makeup sometimes. Things, I mean, things like this are reminiscent of Greek peasant costumes, this little kilt. I think the music has helped an awful lot. I mean, the Sex Pistols, the image of the Sex Pistols wearing these clothes has, um, has made the shop more internationally famous. I don't have any heroes. They're all useless. But for every Johnny Rotten, there's a Malcolm McLaren, that nastiest of pop persons, the manager. When I first met Mal Malcolm, I'd been warned that he was a nightmare. I was told that he was not to be trusted, that he was dangerous, likely to rip me off in some way or another. Caught up in his own machinations is Malcolm McLaren. Would you buy a used car from this man? It didn't seem to be any of those things. He was articulate, challenged opinions. He was always inquisitive. He was a magpie. He could steal ideas everywhere for his artistic endeavours. You don't sell ideas. Ideas are for stealing. Punk was magpie-like. It drew on ideas from all areas. Uh, heavyweight rock and roll, outrageous art, iconoclastic approach to graphics. Jamie, who was the man who did all their graphics, came from an art college. The art influence cannot be underestimated in what it represented uh, culturally. As I moved from a situation where I thought agitprop left-wing politics were just becoming like a middle-class indulgence which weren't communicating or getting anywhere. And so we wanted an opportunity to seize a lot from that situation we were working in before and to communicate it on a broad mass front and the only way and the best way to effectively do that was to was to get the sex pistols for McLaren did package the group and that was very important in the early days and he gave them clothes and later sold them clothes and so they were very stylized the sex pistols and the clothes are very detailed. The, the visual aspects and their attitude is what came over. I mean, the music wasn't, was, you know, I didn't really hear the music until, until months later. Yeah, but I, at that point, without ever hearing any of the music, they're, they're my new favourite band. They were more interested in the clothes and the colour of me poxy hair. Somebody said something fabulous about the Sex Pistols, which was that every time they played, they had a mirror in front of them. They reflected the crowd, you know, what was going on in the crowd, and it was all so sharp and tightly focused. What I should actually say about the Pistols, what I come to realise, that they really, you know, that whole small faces thing, that they really were part of a lineage, and I don't think people give, probably give Steve um, Glenn or Paul enough credence that they really carried the torch of the small faces in a way. The Sex Pistols were an amalgam of talents, much cleverer than people gave them credit for, and they had very distinct, unusual personalities. And Malcolm had obviously cleverly chosen them for that reason, in the way that pop industry gurus do the same thing for a boy band. But he saw this as an art project, and in that sense, they reflected all of those. Uh, th those choices of his. The basic idea behind the Sex Pistols, to tell you the truth, naive that I must have been at the time, was to actually compete with the Bay City Rolling. Mark McLaren was beginning to kind of pitch this thing that, you know, we were this anarchic Bay City Rollers, puppets of his, and I, I didn't like that. It wasn't true. You know, it wasn't true at all. And Sid fitted into that cartoon strip kind of thing. Exactly, so he was a best bloke for the job for what it became. Sid was perfect for Malcolm's plan of the pistols, which was, you know, 
rowdy, likely to get into trouble, likely to cause fights. Looks great, it's going to be a big media, you know, can carry the media off. Can't play, which solidifies the whole pistols. She couldn't play bass, I mean, man, who gave a shit? We should turn him down in the mix. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes they, we should turn him off, actually. We do a last up class, all the dials on the amp. We do that for <laughs> them. Don't worry, Sid. You don't <laughs> need to worry about playing bass. <laughs> you just keep exactly. talking to the girls. Even you didn't care. Yeah. Your sweetheart. McLaren was fascinated with this sort of late 50s archetype. People like Larry Parnes in particular, who was the big um, British rock manager in the, in the late 50s. Pride, gentle, fury, eager. Why do you choose names like that? Well, this means something, you see. Uh, for example, with fury, Billy is nice and friendly, and, and fury is a little bit ferocious, so it gives him the mean streak. In the 30s and the 40s, maybe even earlier, American film stars changed their ethnic names into sort of something much more exciting um, that would, would reflect American values. Parnes had the similar idea. He packaged British pop music, he gave them new suits, instead of being Reginald or, you know, Stephen or something, they'd become Billy Fury, Vince Eager, Duffy Power and Johnny Gentle. Don't you ever feel that, that uh, you are being manipulated just like a puppet sometimes? No, no, they do it right. No, I think it's up to you to go outside and the performance you do, it's, it's all your own, you know, all your own work, what you do on the stage. He and packaged these people like gods, and he made gods out of them, if only for a short while. McLaren was obsessed with Larry Parnes and Billy Fury and this very kind of plastic image of the 50s rocker. And I think there was an extent to which McLaren saw the Sex Pistols in those terms. Look, our group is creating a generation gap for the first time in five years in this country, and a lot of people are feeling genuinely threatened by it. If the kids want to buy the record, it's called Anarchy in the UK, it's out in the shops, they can make their own decisions. Malcolm McLaren and the Pistols, all of them, came to me initially to direct a film for them. At last, the film you thought you'd never have to see. The great rock and roll swindle. Malcolm wanted to have control, and I said, you know nothing about films. He was producing The Great Rock and Roll Swindle initially, uh, with a young director, Julian Temple, who'd come from a national film school, and they ran out of money. They got into terrible financial trouble. I committed a whole chunk of cash, uh, 50,000 pounds, which in those days, that would be equivalent to giving them a million now. Well, the point the film makes is that Martin McLaren wasn't selling a rock band, he was selling outrage. The irony is that now it's the celebrated, iconic film of the era. Sony Pictures are, in my opinion, illegally distributing this film. They have no rights from me, and I have a percentage in it. We've never seen a penny. I've had my money back, and that's all, and we had proper percentages and the film has made millions and millions all over the world and we've not seen our money from it and it's ironic because the great rock and roll swindle which we made turned out to be the biggest swindle of all a swindle on us a charming tale in the streets, in the pubs, everywhere we went. The Slits on Tour got banned from every hotel we went to just from how we looked. You know, every cab wouldn't stop. Every cab we got in would want to chuck us out again. If you wore Vivian's clothes or anything to do with the Sex Pistols, say around 75, you were a magnet for people staring at you. Go on, you've got another five you seconds. Say something outrageous. You dirty Go on, again. The moment it started becoming a tabloid sensation, and with the whole swearing on television. That's when it started to change a lot and would get a lot of aggression. At one point, Sid me literally got like five people like screaming and shouting at us and throwing things because we were wearing the anarchy shirt with the, you know, the swastika armband. Every time anybody sees a swastika, they don't say, oh, fascinating, Far Eastern religious symbol. No, it's Nazis. Every time you see it, 
it's the bloody Nazis. I never even thought twice about it, to be honest with you. It was just a, a yet another fashion statement. That image is so powerful, it can only mean one thing and will only mean one thing. So it's completely stupid and naive to think that we were going to, you know, we were trying to make some ironic, cool political statement, you know. No one's going to get it, no one's going to want to get it. The punk didn't take its beating lying down. After all, there's no sense in running away when you're wearing a pair of bondage trousers. A violent reaction to a violent set of sex. That stupid spitting stuff, you know, which scabies and... I've got a feeling it was rats started all that spitting at the audience. I don't know why, I don't know why. I mean, I don't think the dam could ever complain about that because we invented it. <laughs> and we used to stand there watching the Sex Pistols and we used to govern them, so... I suppose we started the whole thing. It's terrible, isn't it? What, what a claim to fame. People, people say, why do you wear that beret and why do you wear those glasses? And I basically wear them because I used to go on stage and get gobbed at quite a lot. And uh, I never liked getting a gob in my eyes because that was a bit of a pain. I mean, I, could, I, I wouldn't mind it going in my mouth and that because you could always sort of regurgitate it and spit it back. And that became the sort of image that people spat each other and, you know, did silly dancing up and down. Whereas the performance of violence and anger on stage was one thing, it came to be thought that to be a punk you had to be violent off stage or in the audience. And we were getting what we, would, what we thought were people from, that didn't understand the kind of the etiquette of punk. Within months, penguins were pogoing and hippies had cut their hair as the enemies strove to implant an identity crisis in the heart of punk. Everyone was suddenly becoming a real tosser about it. The weekend punks were the worst, actually. They're the ones who'd be slagging you off the most. It was really a really strange situation. Unless you lived through that, I don't think you can understand how, you know, quite nasty it actually was and, and, and vicious and not in a civil way. Suddenly Vivian Westwood would fly out of the sex shop, strike me across the face. This is how Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren wanted these vulnerable teenagers to behave. The idea of trouble was just a magnificent way of life, a form of adventure. Don't you get off on causing fights? If you are so stupid or dangerous or irresponsible to bring that theatre of violence onto the street and attack your own people, then it is going to end in disaster. I just didn't want that sort of level of attention anymore. And so I just literally gave up. I went from punk to disco in a flash, you know, village people. I was went not much of a difference from a fashion point of view, to be honest with you. You went from one sort of leather to another sort of leather. When I saw Joe Strummer um, wearing the logo on his T-shirt, Hate and War, which was the exact negative of the slogan of my teenage years, peace and love. Turn on, tune in, drop out. For this crowd of hip young Americans, these six words are shorthand for an electrifying experience most of them know well, an experience called the trip. If you're going to talk about anarchy, hate and war, you're going to have some quite serious social and personal consequences. I fell out of love with punk rock in the autumn of 77. It seemed to me that the Sex Pistols were becoming a sideshow, they were no longer vital. But when it started, wanted lots of different sorts of groups, not lots of groups all trying to copy each other. It's why like Clash and Sex Pistols, the only two like of the old ones that were any good.
punk has had its share of traitors. Ordinary kids, even idiots, elevated to the rank of idols. But each time a collaborator is exposed, a hundred punks spring up to take his place, adamant in their belief that musicians are no different and no more talented than their audience. Just as we've been disillusioned with teddy boys as not being terribly interesting in the end, we became disillusioned with punk. The thing that really did it for me was when I heard The Clash boasting that they'd never lived, any of them, lower down than five storeys high. And they seemed to think that that was a great badge of working class credibility. And I just didn't want to be in this tunnel with this kind of dull attitude. By the time it hit the mass market, it was, you know, it was over within, within six months to a year. Are you a bank account kind of person? I would like to open a bank account, please. Certainly, sir. Sign this. We need a pound to open the account and a reference, and we'll send you a checkbook in a few days. Is that it? Yes. Punk had become a template, had become a style. In some ways, it become a cliche. Come about a bank account. No chance, mate. Well, certainly, sir. Sign this. A lot of good things came from it, but then again, you know, in retrospect, I think a lot of bad things came from it. You know, like I mentioned before, like, you know, a lot of, you know, stupid behavior, a lot of stupid bands, a lot of dumbed down attitude towards lots of things. At that time, my shop lease was ready to be given up and I decided to keep it because I realised already how much punk had influenced um, the, w the world of fashion. Seeking to transmute the volatile energies of punk into safe commercial profits, an unholy alliance of ageing rock stars and child molesting media businessmen have exhumed the faded fashions of the 50s and 60s. But punk won't go away and punks themselves are becoming younger and nastier every day. Every generation has their attachment to the counterculture. It was superseded by something that was so completely different, which was the, um, the New Romantics. And yet, the New Romantics, again, owed a lot of what they represented to punk movement, fashion-wise, and to the art world. <laughs> looks closely at the designs and the feelings behind punk they can realize that it, it is not at all linked with nostalgia and it's a bit sad that people can't quite view it with the excitement of the time I really liked going to a small club and hearing this fucking noise. I adored it. I loved the feedback on the guitar. I loved the screaming. I loved the really basic, you know, loud, massive drums. I just thought it was fantastic, and I still do. I don't think anybody realized it would be as big as it has become. I mean, you ask any of these sort of like Jack White, any of the bands that come out, I don't know, Sonic Youth, all these things, and they all have punk references, you know, like uh, the Sex Pistols were my favorite band, The Clash, uh, Television, Richard Hell, you know, they did change a lot. Punk was a, a word to describe a phenomenon, and it's persisted. People use it in the language and we still refer to punk influences culturally. So I don't think it's died at all, if anything. I'd say it's been integrated into fashion, to music, into cinema. I, I still believe a lot of the things that I believed then, because why wouldn't I? Because it was great. <laughs> It was this big revolution. Well, it wasn't a revolution, it was a rebellion. You know, it had no aims. 
It was just saying no to everything, which is one of the great, the fun things about it. No, 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 no. I wasn't trying to change the world for kind of for everybody else. I wasn't trying to change the world for me. I didn't care about any, anybody else. The people that are still around and still loving punk rock and rock and roll with attitude are still there and they want to read about the bands. And every year at um, Rebellion Festival in Blackpool, you get eight or 9,000 people there from six to 66 rocking out, you know? So um, it's, it's, it doesn't seem like it's ever going to die. Uh, why should it? And, you know, I guess we're a glorified fanzine because we're, we're, we're just one step away from, from the fans, really. subs have been playing for like what 36 seven years you know the, the vibrators you know they never gave up and Charlie's a great example he, you know he, he just likes to go out and play anywhere the enemy will continue to devise its vile and treacherous stratagems but it cannot kill the unconquerable will of Britain's punk. Malcolm's contribution was massive in that he packaged the whole cultural event What do you think we're doing hanging around that shop? What do you think we were doing, like wearing pink, pink rubber and dyeing our hair? You know, we want to be noticed, we want to be famous. I certainly know, unquestionably, even in this country with all the torrent of abuse I've suffered over the years, I've achieved enormous things. They were smart enough to know. They can't say, you know what, you should write a song called Anarchy in the UK or you should write a song called White Riot. They, were, they knew they couldn't do that, but they could put us in a fertile melting pot of information that would mean if we were smart enough, we would come up with the ideas ourselves. Punk is still taught. I'm a professor at the University of Exeter and it crops up in film studies, cultural studies, theatre studies. We kind of, kind of joke about it, you know, that if someone's kind of um, torn their jeans or, you know, or makes a mistake on stage or anything, you know, that's punk rock, it's all right. It's not a career choice like it sometimes is for people today. It's not if I go on X Factor, I could have a celebrity lifestyle. It was a calling that you can't help it. You see somebody with um, a, a pierced earring, that's punk. Uh, if you see somebody with brightly coloured hair, that's punk. Maybe the uniform might have changed, or the sound might have changed, but it's still punk if you want to call it that. If you are going to die and your brain is still intact and you wish to preserve it, you possibly can purchase another body and you can continue to live on.